Welcome to the Armani Talks podcast. I'm your host, Armani Talks. In this podcast, I'm helping you level up your communication skills. And on this podcast, we have an amazing guest on who has been helping thousands of people level up their mindset, their behavior. They're going to the gym more than ever. Without further ado, Life Math Money, Harsh Strongman, welcome to the show. Hey, Armand, how are you? I'm doing very well, my friend. How's everything going with you? Everything is good. Still under lockdown, but let's see how that goes. I'm hoping this thing ends quickly, but I'm seeing the graphs go up for every other country after they go down. So I think they'll go up again for hours as well. I'm based in India, by the way, so I'm hopeful, but I just know that my hope is misplaced. 100%. It's a little unique that this is the first time in human history something like this is happening at this scale where we're so interconnected as well, where we can all exchange information and sort of stay updated, but still feel out of the loop at the same time. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that despite being bombarded bombarded with information, we aren't being given the right information all the time. So what happens is we receive so much information from social media and everywhere else, and almost all of it is contradicting. So if you read one article, it'll tell you that if you get COVID, you will get organ damage and permanent lung damage and you might die. And another article would say that COVID is nonsense and it's just a small flu and nothing will happen. And you will often find the same outlet giving out contradictory information. So more information in this case is not, does not mean more good knowledge. It just means a lot of data. And I believe what you just brought up sets up the tone for today's conversation where we're going to be speaking a lot about this new generation where there is a lot of data. You would assume people are getting smarter, more informed, but that's not necessarily the case. There's more anxiety, more people feel lost, more people feel confused. So in this episode, Harsh, we're going to be speaking a lot about different contexts regarding human nature, how to thrive in the upcoming generations, and we're just going to be having some fun. So let's just start from the beginning. How'd you end up getting started with Life Math Money? There was a blog that went by the name Bold and Determined. And I saw a couple of articles on there that said that you should try your hand at writing. And since I've been reading that blog for a while, I started my own blog. I called it Life, Math, Money. Life and Money because I wanted to talk about life and money and math because I didn't want idiots reading it. (laughs) So when I published a couple of articles, I waited for a few days. I waited like some time for people to come and read it. But when I checked my analytics on Google, the Google Analytics thing, no one came. So I figured I would need to bring people here somehow. So that's how I started my Twitter account. And that's how Life Math Money became a thing on Twitter. And now we're expanding on different platforms like Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, etc. So initially, Twitter started off sort of as a promotion tool for your blog. Yep. That's insane because you had this meteoric rise on Twitter. Were you expecting that? I wasn't expecting it because when I started, my goal was to get 1,000 followers in one year. And we ended up with 33, 34,000 in a year. So I would definitely say that my goals were too short of what actually happened. But now with all the information I have and the experience I have with Twitter and other social media, I would say that exponential growth is the norm because if your content is good, it's how rumors spread. Rumors spread exponentially and social media spreads exponentially the same way. So the bigger your audience, the more people see it, more people retweet it. And even more people have are looking at it who don't follow you, so they might follow you more. So the bigger your audience, the faster it grows. The bigger the audience, the faster it grows. That's a in pretty absolute good, numbers, yes. Yes, that's a pretty good insight into network theory, where in the beginning of the cycle, 
it's sort of hard to get the chain formed. But as more and more people enter the network, they all start giving value to each other. They all start saying, yo, have you heard of this dope account named Life Math Money? And then they start telling their friends. And soon enough, uh, different people in the world are hearing about you. Oh, absolutely. That's the thing about social media, isn't it? You reach so many places at once that after you have a basic setup done, let's say you have a small following of three, four, five thousand 5,000 people, it's very hard to not grow. I mean, if, you, if your content sucks, it's a different thing, but if you're <laughs> making decent content, it's very hard to not grow because there's so many people talking about you. Right. And how much of a factor do you think the beginning portions are where it feels as though you are tweeting into the air for certain people in the beginning of your journey? And how was it that your ideas were able to connect? Well, for me, I had to figure it out on my own because I, I didn't. So right now I sell a guide that teaches you how to grow a social media audience on Twitter. But when I was growing mine, I had to figure everything out. So the right way is not to just tweet in the air because you're just wasting your time. You need to interact with people. You need to produce a certain type of content. You need to add value a certain way, especially in the beginning, because you just you want to get more eyeballs on your content. So it's different. The growth strategy for your beginning part of Twitter is different for the later parts of Twitter. But you need to craft a better bio, for example. But as you get bigger and bigger, it eventually doesn't matter as much because the network effects are already established. The the margin for error, so to speak, is higher in the beginning because you can say whatever you want and no one is listening. So you can experiment more, but it also comes with... You have to... You cannot just produce content for no one. That's a waste of your time. You need to be replying to people. You need to be interacting with people. But at this point of my account i barely connect with lots of i mean i barely do any replies anymore except with a couple of people whose content i like and it just i don't need to anymore so it's different on what stage you are at 100 percent. and what's pretty cool about this is what you were mentioning is the content is one of the most important parts and if we even take it back a level how do you get that right content and if you were to ask me, it's to have a paradigm shift where you're changing up your lifestyle. It's going to be extremely difficult to produce compelling content if all you're doing is sitting on your butt, filling with your balls, and watching Netflix shows all day. But when you start having certain interests, certain curiosities, and you start delving deep into it, start reading books on it, start working out, it seems as though the great content sort of presents itself. What do you think about that? How much would you say that self-improvement or some sort of improving in a hobby ties into producing better content? I would agree with you completely. To put it in general terms, I would say that if you want to make better content, you need more experience. So for example, if I was to start producing content about video games, it, it would be nonsense because I don't play video games. But I talk about mindset and business because I run two businesses. So I know what I'm talking about. And that's why I can produce content that works for people. People like reading it because it's honest content that's real. I'm not... Uh, so here's the thing. There's a lot of people who produce very vanilla content that are platitudes, sort of, so to speak. They, they don't have any... It's something you would already know. They're not adding any knowledge to you for example someone say if you want to lose weight just do cardio now everybody knows that you've got to do some cardio if you want to lose weight but you haven't added any value with your tweet you haven't shared any experience so if you want to get better at making content you need to get more experience with what you're talking about if you want to talk about fitness you need to have some experience with fitness you cannot be some uh, left-wing, blue-haired guy, fat, chubby man sitting at home and talking about how to deadlift. It, it, it's not, it's bullshit. If you do that, you're a fraud. And I know some people are probably doing that because you can tell by their content that they don't know what they're talking about. 
like you would often find people who share content about money and the only advice with money they have is save 10%, save 10%, which is fine. Everyone knows that, but I mean, what specific value are you adding to me? You're just telling me things everyone knows. Yeah, and what happens sometimes I see is the a lot of psychological principles from the real world get 10 x oftentimes in the online world, where in the real world, there are a lot of leaders, there are a lot of followers. And in the online world, there's a lot of these trailblazers that you'll see. And then there's people that sort of form herds and start echoing the same opinions. And once you read one of them, you feel like you've read all of them. That's a feature of social media because, okay, I'll, 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 I'll put some context to this. Social media is just regular real world, but with much less friction. So what happens is when you are in real world, there's only a certain amount of people you can talk to. And because you are in physical contact with people, you can see their expressions and you are biologically programmed in a certain way to not want to offend people. So you will not say certain things when you can see someone right there. So for if you see a fat guy, in real life, you would not say, hey, fat fuck, go and lift some weight. You wouldn't do that. Like No one does that in real life. But on social media, what happens is there are no consequences to what you are doing. In real life, if you call someone a fat fuck, they might punch you. On right. social media, nothing is going to happen. So what happens on social media is we have no consequences for anything. And it's it's a platform which rewards you for being an asshole. So it's sort of like there are no innovations and you end up seeing how people really are. Now, as, as a human race in general, we evolved in a particular culture and society because these cultures and societies were established a long while ago and they were established because they intended to curb certain human traits. For example, when men are violent, let's say some men get drunk and they start killing each other or they start drinking and driving. A lot of, uh, I mean, drinking and driving is a modern example, but let's say drinking reduces men's productivity and they become useless if they become drunks. So a lot of cultures prohibited drinking because it was not good for people. Likewise, a lot of cultures prohibited promiscuity because it was not good for the stability of society. It was not good for the women. And a lot of these restrictions these cultures created were because these are natural and basic human impulses that they wanted to check or control so that society can function better and society can be more productive. Now, what happens on social media is that this culture sort of does not exist. So when you see people interact on social media, you are seeing raw human hardware, raw human nature without the programming of culture interacting with each other on social media, which is why social media is kind of a cesspool, so to speak. It's Everybody is arguing and screaming at each other. And this is what humans would be like if there was no culture, even in the real world. So I would not say social media is different from the people in social media are different from the people in the real world. I would say that social media exposes human nature for what it is. If 1000 years ago, if you said something that would uh, piss off a lot of people, let's say you said that the earth revolved around the moon, they might just capture you and kill you or if you said that this particular god is fake they, your tribe might kill you but i mean it, it's the same thing right it's the same thing where right. when you when you criticize or you disagree with the commonly held belief people will attack you in real life and that's what happens on social media too so you have factions fighting against each other for example if you say something people don't want to hear Let's say you. If I if I frequently end up in skirmishes with feminists, so if I see something feminists don't want to hear, a lot of them will try to attack me. They'll be like, "Hey, how dare you say this? This is sexist, misogynist, blah blah blah." 
So right. it's the same thing. They're just revealing human nature for what it is. They, they haven't changed. It, we just don't have the veneer of culture on social media. And what would you say to someone like that who's entering this platform? And let's say in Twitter, often this happens where it seems as two different worlds are colliding. You have your crowd of life math money, people that have a certain philosophy or are working towards themselves. And then you do have, say, someone that has blue hair that is super to the left. Yes. How do you deal with it when they start coming for you and your, let's say, polarized opinions? So this is what I do. You could I, so first of all, you could just block them if if it's if they're bothering you. You could just block all of them. But I'm I'm at a point where I want to make money off these people. So I, I'm always trying to experiment and you know improve my personal results. So earlier I would just block them, but now what I do is when I find that I'm being mobbed by all of these people, I leave a couple of product links under my tweet. So I mean, if you're going to mob my account, that. I might as well make some money out of it. So that's what I do. I, I I just monetize it. So I'm at a level where I can make money off my haters. Sorry, you were saying something. No, that's actually smart because the first thing a lot of people do is they go on their apology tour. They're saying, I'm sorry, I never meant it like this. Then they are being forced to apologize for something that they don't necessarily feel sorry about. But for you, I've seen you take the exact opposite approach. Instead of apologizing, you double down and you just shed some insight where you're like, well, I don't only double down, I make money off of it. Well, apologizing to a social media mob is the stupidest thing you can do because these people don't like you. And when someone doesn't like you and you apologize to them, he isn't going to be like, hey, it's okay, man. And you're we're good now. It's not going to be like that. If when you apologize, these people will think you're weak and they'll start attacking you even more. So first, the first rule of social media mobs is to never apologize to a social media mob because that will not make it stop. It will only make it get worse. The second thing is that when I get mobbed, I'm not intentionally being controversial. I'm just sharing my opinion and it's what I really believe. So when I say feminism is nonsense, I truly, honest to God, believe that it's bad for society and it's bad for women because it makes women promiscuous and it sort of makes women feel bad for being feminine. I mean, if, if a woman wants to be a housewife, for the feminists, they would call a housewife a slave, which is bullshit because when you go out and you work for a corporate employer, you're a slave. But when you're working for your husband and your children, you're not a slave. And that's it just, you're not a slave. When if you're raising your children and you're at home and you're taking care of your family, you're not a slave. But if you're constantly unhappy and working for an employer for like a small check, at that point, yes, you are a slave because you're giving up what biologically makes you happy. And this is my truth, God to honest opinion. And if someone thinks this is quote unquote misogyny or hate for women, and I'm not going to apologize for that. They can go fuck themselves. And <laughs> I'm going to make money off of it. <laughs> that's that's uh, definitely unique because some people polarize just for the sake of it they there's certain individuals who want to you know say certain opinions because they know it's going to get a reaction but what you're saying is you're just doubling down on your natural beliefs which is why well, i can substantiate my beliefs they're not like i didn't make them up like one day i was like this is what i believe now i critically thought about them and i can substantiate to you like i don't have to call you a misogynist or a hater I don't have to resort to ad hominem attacks. I can I can substantiate how I came up with this belief and I'm happy if someone has the criticism or someone wants to add anything to it. But 99.99% of the time, people will just call you a hater or a misogynist or sexist. It's it's kind of like calling someone who doesn't believe in God, what's the word, blasphemy? I, I, don't, know how, I don't know how to pronounce it. Blasphemy? Yeah, that one. So it's just a word. You're not you're not saying that I'm wrong. You're just saying that I disagree with you and I've hurt your feelings. That's what you're saying. And I'm not going to apologize for hurting your feelings. It's that's not happening. I when I started Life Math Money, I, I started because I didn't really care about 
weak man. I wanted to help a particular section of society who was looking to improve. You are not my audience anyway. When when these uh, blue haired, fat, chubby men, uh, gaming people attack me, it's like so what? Like if I if I even pander to you, you're not gonna read my articles anyway. So might as well diss you off, call you a peasant, have my fun, make some cash. And it's unique that you brought this up because I wrote an email about this a couple of weeks back where there used to be this fitness account that I used to follow and it's rather big. But recently that fitness account started to get some criticism for not having more plus size models for their account. And if you, (laughs) yeah, but, and if you check out their whole brand, it's, like shredded people. I'm talking people with like 12 pack abs. I mean, they look like cartoon characters, but (laughs) what they did was they bend the knee. They started to put this one dude who's just rocking his gut and saying, "Uh, we vibe with you. And (laughs) what I kid you not. And what started to happen right after that is different people, uh, their loyal fans start to be like, yo, what are you doing? And to make it even worse, there were individuals, uh, other individuals who were like, okay, well, you're promoting uh, plus size people. Well, what about short people? How come you're not promoting us? And then someone's like, well, how come you're not promoting skinny people? And it just opened up this whole whirlwind of them just having controversy left and right. They let their real fans down and now they got a lot of these whiners, complainers, wanting stuff, even though these people are never going to buy a single product from them. Exactly. Where does You have to ask yourself, where does this shit end? Now, if I start saying this is correct, if, if, if I feel something is bullshit and I start saying this is correct just to pe- protect people's feelings, now there's a lot of bullshit on the internet, man. There's people who think fortune telling is real. There's a bunch of people who do numerology bullshit. And where, where do you stop? Where do you draw the line? Like this guy, now now these people are promoting a fat guy for their fitness brand. First of all, it's going to hurt their existing audience because they're going to be like, hey, what the hell? Why do you have a fat guy on a fitness brand? This guy is not even fit. And exactly. I'm not saying that everyone has to be shredded. I, I don't believe that because I've been shredded and I've been very thin. And what ends up happening is you're not very strong at that point. And at least I was constantly hungry and drowsy because I was not eating enough calories. So I find that my performance is best when I'm above 15%. I'm usually around 18, 20% body fat. So I don't necessarily believe that everyone has to be shredded. But I do think that this, where you have to accept everybody is complete nonsense. It's kind of like this, okay? If all of these people who are complaining that you're not featuring short men, now I've heard, now think of it like this. If if you had a short and fat guy and he were a woman, would you voluntarily date a short, fat guy if you had a thin, tall guy and they were relatively, in all other fields, they were very similar, but this one guy is short and fat and the other guy is tall and jacked. It's like, which one are you going to choose with all honesty? Yeah, with all honesty. Like, don't, don't give me a politically correct answer. Like, Tell me the truth. If you had to marry your daughter, would you marry her to a guy who is tall and jacked or a guy who is short and fat, all other things being equal? And now, that's, now here's another thing. When you run a fitness brand, the guys who are your models have to be fit. You're demonstrating your product essentially when you have a model and why would you demonstrate your product with a fat guy, which which is like not even demonstrating a product properly? It's like saying you're going to demonstrate a book, but also having an iPad next to it, just just to include iPads too. Yes, and ultimately, what it goes to show is three groups of people always form when you have enough data. It's one group that loves you, one group that is indifferent towards you, and one group that flat out hates you. Now, what happens is a lot of the times we try to get groups two and three, the people who are indifferent towards us Mm -hmm. and who hate us to love us. 
rather than just doubling down on the people who love us. And when we take that strategy, people who love us now begin to feel neglected. Like, how come he's only focusing on these other two groups so much? You know what? Now we're indifferent towards them or we hate them. And it just blows my mind because it's an easy decision, but oftentimes uh, due to a lot of the human nature of wanting to be accepted, you try to get everyone to like you, which just isn't possible, especially when you're speaking your personal truth and your personal experiences. Okay, here's my experience with business, and it kind of ties into this. When you create something, you are, well, you have two options. You can either create something that everybody sort of wants, but they don't really, really want it, that, but they all sort of want it. Or you can create something that uh, a small portion of the population really, really, really wants, and most people are indifferent or they don't like it. And given an option like this, you should always pick option two because when you create something a small portion of the population really likes, you will have a business. People will buy from you. Even if even if that's only 1% of the population really likes you and the rest of the, the 99% hates you, completely hates your guts, you will still make money off that 1%. But if you have a product that everybody kind of likes but no one really likes, no one's going to buy from you. No, they might buy from me once, but you will not have repeat customers. It's just, it's just not a good business. You will not be successful. And once, it's just a bad idea. In fact, uh, I, I read this tidbit. I'm not sure how accurate this is, but do you know when they make TV shows, the first episode is called a pilot. Yeah. And what they do is they show that pilot episode to a group of people. And they ask them how much to like the pilot on a scale of 1 to 10. Now, if everybody says they liked it, say everybody says it was a 7 or a 6, they cancel the show because it's, it won't be successful. But if, say, out of 100, 10 people say they found it to be extremely good, let's say they rate it out of 9, 9 out of 10, or 10 out of 10, 10 people, and the other 90 say it was a 0 out of 10, they will make the show because they know the show will have an audience, a successful audience, because a group of population likes it very much, even if the even if the rest of them don't. So that's what you want to do with your own creations as well. You want a certain part of people to really, really like it. It has to be very helpful to them. And the rest of them can go fuck themselves. They're not your customers. They're not your target audience. <laughs> That's actually interesting. I never even knew that pilots did that. But it does tie into this one actor. He was recently saying that nowadays, a lot of the Hollywood industry is becoming dead because a couple of decades back, they used to truly try to create art. But nowadays, what they try to do is they try to create works that appeal to so many different people that instead of allowing a worldwide blockbuster to naturally emerge, that's what they're chasing from the get-go. So it's hard to create characters that resonates with a certain segment of people because they're just trying to immediately create their screenwriting, their scripts to appeal to the entire world, which dilutes the art. So this actor is saying to have the reverse philosophy, double down on what you do best, and then from there, others will naturally join in. And I personally have noticed that. I, I know you don't watch much movies, Harsh, or I don't know mm -hmm. if you watch any movies. But in terms of my field for storytelling, uh, I do have to, like, you know, I, I can get some creative insights from shows and movies every now and then to better help with storytelling. And I've noticed that recently there's not as much art that's been created. Every now and then you'll get a Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad. But a lot of the times, it just seems as though it's trying to appeal to too many people. I believe what you're doing great with Life Math Money is that's not your concern. You're not trying to appeal to everyone else. You're trying to niche down. But surprisingly, your account has been still growing extremely rapidly. Well, I think that's because although I'm niching down, a lot of what I'm saying is what everybody believes to be true, but 
people don't have the balls to say it out loud now here's the thing okay if 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 you go out in india if you if you go to a random village or any any place in india that's not like a liberal urban bubble and you ask them is it okay for a man to have sex with a man they're going to say no almost all of them will say no i would wager that maybe one out of 2 3 100 people will say yes and but on social media you cannot say that on social media if you have like if you have a corporate job or something and you cannot say that this is wrong and it should not be promoted like the way it is being promoted so people believe certain things but there's a very small vocal minority of people which is so loud that it stops everybody else from expressing themselves so if you were to go out and say arman that i don't think gay people should have special rights people are going to mob you people are going to be like fire this guy from his job and they they they're going to be out for you but 99 point most of the world believes that it's not right and i just say it so i have a big following because i speak for the common person i am the voice of the silent majority or the silenced majority so to speak because a lot of people have the opinions i have a lot of people think that women should not be promiscuous this is not like a secret but you cannot say it nowadays because of the social structure and because of this very very loud and vocal minority of people who oppose anything like if if you if you say feminism is wrong people are going to accuse you of hating women which is dumb which because it makes no sense feminism the idea of feminism is supposed to be about, about equality and if you think equality is wrong how does that mean you hate women it, it makes it has no logical credence or there is no there's no way you can conclude that but people do conclude that because there's a small vocal minority who leave you 1000 comments saying that hey you hate women you hate women you hate women you're you're evil land it's just people most people agree with me if you go out in the world and talk to the average person he's going to agree with what i say it's just online that no people can't say these things so because i say them people like me they find it refreshing okay finally someone is saying what we want to be say what we want to be saying so i am popular because i speak for the average person of the world and would you say there's certain things that you do have a filter on where you're like all right i'm not going to touch that or not really i avoid talking about politics because it's a waste of time and has there's nothing to learn from it i mean i talk about feminism because there's a lot you can learn from that ideology about women and that will help you in your dealings with women but talking about politics has even if you are right or wrong or right or left or whatever but there's there's nothing you can there's no real world application of that knowledge so it's a waste of your time to even talk about it so i avoid politics in general but there's nothing else i don't avoid anything else i'm very very open about what i think i avoid topics i don't know anything about like i would not talk about steroids because i've never used one and i don't know anything about it so it would be kind of dumb for me to start talking about it so i i avoid topics i don't know anything about but other than that i'm i'm very authentic about my thoughts like this is what i think if you like it follow me if you don't like it leave and follow me <laughs> but people want to like i am on following you <laughs> i'm like okay that's that announce fine. it they announce, announce it, it. No. <laughs> harsh has blocked me like this guy must be insecure i'm like okay bro <laughs> every now and then i see a screenshot of you having blocked the person and they'll be like yeah yeah look at him i got him to block me i won yeah it it's very weird people do that to everybody now and if i've seen like people tweeting under donald trump and then be like i got blocked by the president there was something where they said that the people were making videos of some kind where they were blocking donald trump on twitter and then acting like they've achieved something like i blocked trump like i don't think he cares bro the guy is so rich i don't think he cares about some idiot in the world blocking him on twitter <laughs> well to speak about that uh, you mentioned earlier that you don't really talk about politics but nowadays it, it seems as though this is one of the fields that are polarizing so many people because when i first came into the us 
sure people stayed updated on politics but let's say people did have different candidates that they chose or whatever it wasn't as heated as it is nowadays so nowadays when i check my facebook i see different people going back and forth paragraph after paragraph i'm like dang man politics is really bringing out a different side of people in this time i'm sure it's happened in past generations but it only feels amplified now because like we said earlier global communications global technology is a thing i think it has a lot to do with the decline of religion and when you don't have religion or you don't have fundamental beliefs or a way of thinking whatever is the most talked about topic at that point of time or in that age or era becomes your religion so right now everybody cares so much about politics to the point where they made the china virus a political thing how do you make a disease political so if you are right wing you think it's bullshit and if you if you are left wing you think it's going to kill you the moment you get it and i don't get how the americans managed to make a virus political but everything is politics now because there people don't have other beliefs they have so if you are say a hindu you have certain beliefs you have a way of life that you follow and the rest of the whole society or the whole political thing is ancillary to your life but when you don't have a religion or you don't have core beliefs or a way of life politics becomes your way of life then you are just a pawn and you are trying to convince everyone on social media to believe in your cause it's very hard for you to ignore political stuff because it's the only thing you have and you it's it's human nature to want to believe in something and since you didn't have anything to believe in you didn't have any religion or philosophy this is what you believe in it just fills it fills the void and since it they this constantly generating information there's always things happening politically it's going to keep you engaged like a junkie so it's a very unhealthy thing but i think the reason is that the people don't have anything else in their life i think it was a philosopher slash psychologist nietzsche who was saying that he was sort of predicting something like this a couple of decades back or he was saying when, when you take away a foundational belief of someone's mind it starts to become extremely chaotic and recently i made a youtube video talking about why people are getting distracted so quickly and i was saying that their mind lacks some sort of foundation and this foundation could be religion it could be some sort of big spiritual truth it could be a business that you're working on it could be your family but ultimately <laughs> Yes, ultimately it needs to have your mind needs some sort of foundation because without it your thoughts necessarily don't have an underlying narrative. So you begin entertaining every single thought that you're starting to have. And if you're a meditator, you'll eventually make an insight that a lot of your thoughts don't serve any sort of meaningful purpose. It's just a random thing that your mind can do. chatter oh, without yeah it's called chatter there's actually a phrase for it so that's what happens when you lack any sort of foundation for the mind you entertain every single thought and it's easier for other people to brainwash you other people to grab control of your mind and tell you how to think exactly so if you at that point you're just a vessel for whatever outrage comes your way and and that's actually something that's very interesting to think about because a lot of these political people or a lot of these people in general they have certain beliefs at a given point of time but when the trend set or leader says something else their beliefs change for example people used to support this guy um what's the guy's name the blonde hair journalist who was kicked out Julian Assange people used to be like Julian Assange is a good guy and we should bring him back and then what happened is he published these Hillary Clinton emails on his WikiLeaks website and now the people who were supporting him earlier hate him because he hurt Hillary Clinton's campaign i'm not very sure but by the way about this because i, I i'm not american so i don't follow american politics but, but from this is what i know is that people now hate him because he released Hillary Clinton's emails or something like that and 
which is like you have these people aren't doing any critical thinking on their part they just have a side or like their what well, their religion basically the, the her religious leader is this political party and anything that supports this political party is good and anything that hurts this political party is bad and it's very cultish so to speak because the, as i said earlier they managed to make the virus a political thing so if you are left wing you think this virus is the greatest the worst thing that it's ever happened and anyone who gets it dies and everyone should wear a mask and goggles or whatever and if you're right wing somehow this virus is nothing and it's just a cool and it's a tyranny and everyone's just making it up so it it's you have to think critically and by critically i don't mean you have to the truth is somewhere in the middle that's not what i mean because that's often wrong if one person says 2 plus 2 is 4 and the other person says 2 plus 2 is 8 it does not mean 2 plus 2 is 6 it it doesn't mean the truth has to be in the middle there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong and if you critically think you can often arrive at those for example left wing people tend to think that iq is bullshit and everyone is the same and it's all about upbringing which is scientifically false it's bullshit if if anyone who says that iq is fake is an idiot but th- that doesn't mean everything the left wing people say is wrong it just means they're wrong about a lot of things about this particular thing let's say likewise when the right wing people say that covid-19 or as i like to call it china virus because that they made it so as the china virus is fake which is not true because i know people who have had this virus and they don't feel the same and a lot of people have died from it and so that by definition doesn't mean it's bullshit so it in that case the left wing is right and the right wing is wrong so you have to critically think everything that every belief you hold you have to critically think through it and i don't think the truth lies anywhere in the middle like it does sometimes but it it it's not you cannot go by the heuristic that you have to somehow be diplomatic and say the truth is in the middle like it can be anywhere you just have to find it and how would you recommend that people level up their critical thinking skills because just like the word states it is a skill so it's something that needs to be practiced cultivated and worked out on do you have any tips for that to be honest i don't know how someone could um do it or practice it i, I mean that's my honest answer i don't i don't know i don't know how it could be done i just, I just don't know i i was i was born with the ability to critically think okay so I, for me i'm not me, sure how it could be cultivated if i had to take a guess i would say start from the first principles and see if it adds up or not and see if it holds good in the real world or not like impartially don't put your biases and don't try to alter reality just i would say try to see if your beliefs work in real life for example if you believe that eating more calories causes you to lose weight i mean it's a bullshit belief but let's say someone believes that now i don't know how you would critically think that out but what you could do is that you could try eating a lot of calories and see if you lose weight and you would if you eat a lot of calories you would gain weight and you would know that your belief was wrong so i think that's one thing you could do you could test it out i'm not sure how it could be how you could train critical thinking i don't know right so for me personally i do have an opinion on this where i do think a big part of sharpening your critical thinking faculties is getting some form of experience so you can build judgment for yourself and the one thing that i've noticed is all advice sounds like good advice when you lack experience when i was first starting my True. journey uh, when i was first starting my journey with toastmasters have you heard of toastmasters oh yeah i went to a toast, toastmasters once and they gave me a ribbon oh nice man uh, a lot of people don't get that ribbon ever but yeah it's a great public speaking club and when i was thinking about joining there was this one guy uh, who was just like no nah, man don't even bother bro that club just doesn't work it, it didn't work for me i went to five different meetings man he just trying to talk me out of it well eventually i ended up not taking this guy's advice and i ended up going and it truly did help me out with public speaking there's very few avenues we have nowadays where 
we can just give a speech. Afterwards, I come out to find that this dude is just a quitter and a lot of things he does. He's one of those guys that'll, you know, get something and just be like, oh, it doesn't work. Uh, it's a scam. And I'm like, imagine if that advice is something that I listened to, uh, but I didn't. And that's because sometimes you need to have the courage to gain that experience yourself, feel in a mode where you're okay looking like a fool. But what that mm -hmm. does is it allows you to gain that experience, sharpen that judgment. And eventually that judgment is one of the best things that you can have for critical thinking. Judgment can't be brought uh, by you go on amazon.com and buy some judgment. It's something that's earned. That's why I think certain people are capable of critical thinking because they're able to apply their mental models that they've earned in different contexts. While some people aren't building that experience or if they are building experience, it's not the right kind. Well, I will say this, if someone wants to increase their critical thinking ability, one way to do that would be to read how other people critically thought through things. So you gain an understanding of the process and I would recommend studying math. So I, I've always enjoyed math. So it, I've, I haven't had that experience where people think math is bad or they hate math. I've always loved math and I was very good at it. And I think it's honed my critical thinking ability because when math is very black and white, there is no gray in math. There is no bias. So if if you want to increase your critical thinking ability, I would say learn how to prove things mathematically. And that will teach you quite a bit in real life as well. And I, I, I would recommend learning math and physics, maybe physics, yes. And uh, if you're familiar with Charlie Munger, I would say learn about mental models and learn more mental models and try to apply them in the situations you come across. Also, I I would say you need to have friends who are smart and occasionally debate topics with them. And, you know, you need to have some ground rules where, for example, if someone disagrees with you or you disagree with someone, you're not allowed to ad hominem attack them. You have to logically tell them that they're wrong. So I think that would be a good way to practice your um, critical thinking skills. And uh, I suppose, I think I think that would cover most of it. You know, if you can like find a couple of people who you can have legitimate debates with, read other people's way of critical thinking or how they arrive at their conclusions and avoid the temptation to get into rhetorical stuff where you say things creatively that are persuasive, but not exactly logical. So there's, there are certain ways where you can say bullshit that makes it sound very legit, but that doesn't make it legit. And since your goal is to improve your critical thinking ability, you want to avoid getting into that rhetorical way of persuasion. So for now, just focus on getting your logic up. I wonder if IQ plays a role because it probably does if, if someone is dumb, if someone is an IQ of 80, I am unsure how capable they are of real critical thinking. But if someone is 120, they can do it. If, if, they, if they put their minds to it, they can do it. And that's where certain worlds of street smarts and book smarts come into play. Like for me personally, my background, I got engineering training for the beginning of my life. In undergrad and in my master's, I worked in different engineering firms. And I noticed that a lot of these professions are capable of critical thinking beautifully. And at times, I think it's also great to know when to you know, turn it down just a little as well. Because a lot of the engineers that I would work with were a little awkward at times where they would try to take the same logic from machines and they would be a little too critical with humans and when you're doing too much critical thinking with humans at times you can have the tendency to judge or evaluate them from the lens of right and wrong and that's when some that's when i personally learned a lesson that even though i was all engineering trained i needed to be able to turn down those modes of critical thinking 
at times when dealing with other people. And for the later part of my life, I've been working more on communication skills. So although the two worlds seem completely disparate, you'll see a lot of connections between the two. And I think that's beautiful when you can see connections between two different fields. Has that been something that you've been doing? Because I noticed from the name Life, Math, Money, some people may see similarities between those words, but are you seeing different similarities that you didn't expect to see before? Sure. Like, I haven't like actually um, really thought about this. Just so I, I'm just like saying this on the fly, but yeah, there are quite a few similarities. For example, if you take money, how do you get rich? You don't get rich with diversification. You get rich by concentrating your money on a few bets that you are very sure would play out and you hope they do well. And once you've made your money, you diversify into so that you can protect it. Now, that's what happens in life as well. So when you are making your money, like or, or say, let's say when you are starting a business, you are investing all of your time into a particular activity, hoping it pays out big. But once you have your business, everything fully grown, you want to invest your time in other things as well, like your health. I mean, you should, you need to be working out before as well, but you'll invest more time in your health because you already have your foundation set up and you will diversify the application of your time to become a more complete person. And there are a lot of similarities with everything. Everything is somewhat connected, but there are very differences as well because life is finite and it's your youth is finite. Right now, I'm in my 20s, you are in your 20s. But when we will be 60, we will not have as much energy. And when we will be 70, we would have even less energy. But money would still be the same. <laughs> okay, let me That's let me true. change that <laughs> sentence. Let me, they're printing too much money for this to be true anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, the physical paper for sure. But the, the process Let, of value the amount of gold you have in your hands would still be the same. If you have fiat money, it'll be nothing in six years. So the, my sentence, they fucked it up by printing too much money. Yes, but the whole process of value creation, that should be timeless to a certain degree. Would you agree? Um, not exactly. I mean, it should be timeless, but you can't... Well, here's the, here's the thing, okay? A lot of people nowadays think that they have forever to do something, which is not true. You need to be fast. You will die soon. So while it's true that it has to be timeless, your time is limited. So you got to start as soon as possible and put in your best because there will be a too late. Right now, I, I don't, I'm not married. I don't have children. So I have fewer responsibilities than I would have in 10 years. So if I waste the time today, I will lose out on a lot of opportunities that I could have pursued. I couldn't. I couldn't start a business twenty years from now, and because I wouldn't be. I mean, I could, but I would be more risk averse because I would have like a family to support. So that although the principles are timeless, but the time you have to actually execute them is very limited. One hundred percent. I feel as though, especially right now. What you mentioned, Harsh, is you're sort of like a speedboat versus a big ship. Since you just said you are not married with kids, where it's it's much easier to be dynamic. It's much easier to dedicate time to being an autodidact, learning different skills. So you're able to create value. And I do think that's something that at times, and I do want to get your opinion on this, can make it difficult to balance a lot of things. Like when you're doing entrepreneurship and you're delving into the business world, do you think it's hard to balance other things like having a consistent social life or do you find a way to still balance it as well? Balance is bullshit. Okay, I'll tie it up to what I said earlier. You don't want to diversify when you are building your wealth or you're building your life. You want to concentrate it. 
like I said earlier, didn't I? With money. So here's how it would tie into life. You, you don't want to die. You don't want to be in balance. You want to be obsessed. So if you are, say, someone who's not fit, you want to be obsessed with fitness to the point you have no time for a social life because you are busy getting fit. And once you get fit, you want to preserve your fitness and then you want to, like, say, take up a business and fix your finances. And once your business and finances are doing well, then you will have more time to diversify into your social life and everything else. Now, this doesn't mean you should not have a social life when you don't have everything else figured out, but it shouldn't be a priority at all, in my opinion, at least. Uh, th- it was not a priority to me when I was unfit. It, it just wasn't. I, I barely went out. I was just in the gym and working on my businesses. And now that I have all of those things figured out, I have more leeway to spend my time on more fun things. So I, it, you just have to prioritize things. I don't think balance is a good idea because it means you would be mediocre with everything. Do you get me? You cannot, you cannot be balanced and be good at everything. You have you, you are either mediocre at everything or you are not. Have you ever heard of uh, the four stove theory? No. So it's a theory I learned from James Clear, and there's four stoves, right? Uh, one I believe is for fitness. One is for money. One is for friends. One is for family. Uh, don't quote me on that. I just know there's four stoves. I forgot the labels. And he was saying, if you want to be great at something, you got to turn on one stove at the most. You need to focus most of your energy on that and then eventually spread the energy among the other three stoves. And then he did talk about the balanced life, which is like, you're not trying to become great at anything. You're trying to, like, let's say balance. Then you turn on all four stoves. But I thought this was a unique way of breaking things down because it does showcase the different mentalities in terms of trying to achieve greatness in a field versus if you just want to ease up a little. And I think you've mentioned you don't watch sports, correct? I've watched one game in my entire life and that was back in 2012. Okay, but have you heard of the mindsets of guys like Kobe Bryant, for example? Are I you, have no idea who that is. Oh, you don't know? Who, okay. What about Michael Jordan? I have no idea who that is. Okay. Well, these are athletes that are at a point where they had to become so great at a certain craft that they completely tuned out other parts of their life, but not so much to a point where everything else started to fall apart. It's just people would think that they were like, maniacal at times but ultimately they were able to balance out later on in the game so it's a completely different strategy but i see where you're going with this and do you have a certain level of priority that you think people in their 20s should focus on first it it seems like you're saying social life could come a little bit later once you have the wealth fitness and skills first do you have a certain level of importance on each one well, I, I'll first clarify what I said. So when I say social, uh, social life shouldn't be a priority, this this does not mean that you should have no social life. This means that you need to limit your social life to say going out twice a week at best, once or twice a week, just to preserve your social skills and have some fun. But there is there's there's no circumstance under which I would say you need to hang out, quote unquote, hang out four or five times a week because that's just a waste of time. Now, my priority, I would, I would prioritize it like this, okay? When you are 18 to 21, you're not... I mean, when I was 18 to, 18 to 21, I was doing my CA final articleship. I was an intern. So I would spend a lot of time in the gym, so to speak. Not, not that much because I was busy. But at that point, my focus was learning. My education was my main focus, okay? And I'm going to assume that everybody here who's listening to this podcast got done with their education by 22. Now, your priorities at first should be health and money. In my opinion, you need to focus on getting your career or starting a business and creating that business into something that is going to be your financial foundation for the rest of your life or it's going to give you a lot of experience even if it fails. 
So it's it's worth it to have it as your first priority. And while you're doing that, you need to also fix your body and lift weights and get strong. I think these would be your two priorities for a long time. And once you have these things sort of figured out, you can start going out more and having more fun. Although to be very fair with you, I kind of like working, so it's fun for me. I'm not exactly a workaholic, but the things I do for fun are, I mean, I kind of found a way to monetize my hobbies, right? With Life Math Money itself is a hobby that is monetized now, so it makes me money. So it's, I don't think a lot of people ever get to experience the the joy of working, so to speak. So I, w- I would say just, wo- just, just fix your finances and health first because everything else just rests on those two things. Everything else, like, you, could, you could have like the best social life in the world, but if you have no money and you lose your health, you will lose your social life as well. It's just going to go away. Likewise, if you have money, but you lose your health, you're not going to enjoy your money. Let's say you, you, let's say you are the richest person in the world, but you are, you have some crippling diseases or something. It's not a good, good state to be in. Likewise, being so, your first priority would always have to be your physical health. And once you have that figured out, your money, your finances, you want to work on them together, and everything else is secondary. Your family, sure, like, obviously, you have to give your family time, but. If you end up broke and unfit, even your family would give up on you eventually. Not not your mom and dad, but your everything, everyone else in your family. And the, it reminds me of a quote which said, uh, money is not the root of all evil. Lack of money is the root of all evil. That was an interesting quote. But one thing that you were saying earlier, Harsh, Anyone was... Anyone who believes that money is the root of all evil should give it to me. In the video description, you will find my Bitcoin address. <laughs> I'll be sure to post that uh, on the link. Uh, but earlier, you were mentioning about how you were able to monetize your hobbies. And this was a discussion that I was having with one of my friends recently, who was talking about how he, at this point in his career, he's a chef. And to even get a little bit more niche down, he makes videos on like the fish niche. So he, there's a lot of different exotic fishes that he catches and he records himself cooking it. And he's able to make a career out of this. And have you ever heard of the thousand fan rule? Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. You need 1,000 fans who would give you $75 a year or something like that. Yeah, 75 to $100. And it was fascinating because in this generation, due to information technology, if you have an understanding regarding the internet, a little bit of social media marketing or some form of communication skills on the internet, being able to monetize your hobbies isn't a stretch like how you've been able to do. And that's what I feel like I'm doing all the time too, where I enjoy public speaking, I enjoy storytelling, and I'm like, oh, wait, I could actually get paid for this? That's pretty awesome. So this is a mode of thinking that some people should think about adopting in this information age. Yeah, it takes a certain amount of, it takes a mindset to be able to monetize a hobby because when most people are online, they aren't there to learn, strictly speaking. I'm not talking about people who follow people like us, like people who are learning from us. I'm talking about the average person. They are not there to learn. They are there to watch cat videos and watch pranks of people, say, throwing sodas on each other or some stupid stuff. And they're there to watch Netflix movies. They're not there to learn. So it is entirely possible, but I don't think most people have the capability or IQ or the inclination to do it. Gotcha. And let's say they wanted to do it. What skill sets do you think are important to be able to be able to monetize your hobbies in the information age? What are some timeless principles you would recommend? Well, the first one I said earlier, a certain portion of people need to really like you and regardless of what everybody else thinks rather than just everyone sort of liking you. So that's the main thing because otherwise you have no target audience. Are you getting me? 
The second one would be you need to be consistent and you can't expect to build your audience or your empire in one day. Right now, I have hundred. I have about two hundred thousand followers on Twitter. I have a hundred thousand plus people who come to my website, and quite a few people follow me from on other social media platforms as well. And a lot of people are on my. I have fifteen thousand people on my newsletter. So it took me two and a half years to get here. I I didn't get here in two months. What most people do is they do something for like two three months and they're like, okay, this is not working out, so they quit, and this that's just too soon you didn't you didn't give it a chance to work out so it's just that's really it some a portion of population really has to like it and you have to be consistent with it consistent with it yes and this is a little bit of a um a different topic but it sort of ties into what we're saying i've noticed with the information age it's extremely easy to neglect the mind at times. And one tweet that I wrote recently is that one thing that hap- helps tremendously if you do have some sort of digital business is meditation to urge a certain extent because your mind is capable of taking so much stimulus at one time. While with information technology, you there's a phrase, it's like scrolling is the new smoking. And it makes sense because you're going from different content piece to different content piece. It seems small in terms of your phone, but for your mind, you're basically conditioning it to go from new thought to new thought to new thought. This is why I personally think that having some sort of mind activity, I call it the mind gym, like meditation, is crucial. Do you do anything like meditation in your day-to-day life? Oh, yeah. I meditate about 20 minutes every day. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, I read a lot of books. So I read about an hour per day, which is really just sitting there and, you know, focusing on a book. And I play a lot of chess in my free time. So, yeah, I, I get what you're talking about. And it's true. The thing with social media is that it's all bite-sized information. You have two eighty character tweets, one minute YouTube reel, or what, what do they call it? Where they post TikTok or something, right? The so clips, it's like yeah. one one minute video, and you're basically training your mind to not focus on anything. So a lot of people would find that if they had to actually study, they can't focus on their book for more than a few minutes because they've trained their mind to not be able to focus and constantly seek a new dopamine hit. Have you played a game called Dota 2? Dota 2? No, I haven't. Okay, so there's no point talking about it then. But it's it's a game where I sort of studied it. Okay, I have a friend who is very addicted to it. I have uh-huh. a couple of friends who are very addicted to that game. So I wanted to figure out what was uh, the game about. So I played a couple of matches with them. So it, it has something where you have to conquer... Uh, towers or something okay there are like three lanes you have to conquer towers and you have small groups of enemies coming across each lane and if you kill an enemy you get some money or something like that so when you when you kill, and the, the thing is that the these enemies would they did some research maybe i don't know how but these enemies would come to you every 15 20 seconds 30 seconds or something and when you kill them, after a while, you start feeling nice, okay? Like, you just kill someone, like, you kill an enemy. And you keep on doing it every 20, 30 seconds. And the game keeps you entertained that way. It gives you a small hit of dopamine every 20, 25 seconds. It doesn't give it to you every two seconds because that would be too much. And it doesn't right. make you wait 10 minutes. It gives it to you every 30 seconds or 15 seconds or something. I think that's the thing. I mean, if if you are constantly being bombarded with dopamine every twenty seconds, you will become addicted to something, and that's what happens with social media. Why do you scroll all the time? It's because you are addicted to scrolling. Yes, and it's a phrase I called the distraction muscle, where even though you can't see it, it is something that exists, and if you keep working it out, you're not going to be able to control your thoughts or any mode of it. And if you can't control your thoughts, you want to evaluate, are you really free or not? And this is why I think some sort of practice uh, of um, the mind 
is extremely important, especially the more interconnected that we're becoming. Do you have a certain way that you meditate? No. So this is something I get a lot of flack for because I recommend people meditate, but I have no particular way I meditate. I just sit there, I breathe deep, and I try to focus on my breath, and that's all I do. If you ask me what is Vipassana meditation, I don't know. I haven't researched it. I just, I just sit at a place, sit upright, don't lie down, and just keep your back straight, and try to clear your head. Okay, You don't, you don't want to like force your thoughts to go away, but if a thought comes into your head, you don't want to focus on that thought. You just want to like let it slide, and you want to breathe deep and nice, and just don't get into the whole thinking about something and just focus on your breath that's that's all i do this it's regular meditation i don't know what what the correct word for it would be it's vipassana or not i'm not sure i do I think that's vipassana what you just mentioned is it <laughs> okay i think so i think so so what are some of the effects you've had since you've been doing this anything that you're noticing okay so you know before i start meditating if i had something to be worried about it would sort of, you know, replay in my head. I would think about it. Then after a while, the thought would pop into my head again. Then I would think about it and again and again and again. You know, you, if you've had that thing where you can't stop thinking about something. Yes. It could be from like 10 years ago, but it's just replaying out of nowhere. Yeah, not, not 10 years ago. I mean, like stuff that's happening to you right now. Like something you are worried about right away or some emotion that you're playing into your head again and again. Right. It, it just ke- it keeps on repeating. Exactly, exactly. It keeps on repeating. And that goes away. If you meditate a lot, that basically almost goes away. And you are in f- more control of your thoughts and your mental state. Even if it doesn't go away, you cultivate an attitude where it doesn't bother you. Where the way that I meditate personally... And there's different strategies I try to accumulate, try to experiment with. I have tried the breath. One thing I try to do before a speech is what we call body meditations. This is something that one of my Toastmasters mentor taught me, where you feel not only the different thoughts that go in your mind, but you feel the sensations of your body. So you start to use that as energy for your speech. So you turn it from speech anxiety into speech excitement. But ultimately, I think one of the easiest ones that's changed my life is where you're sort of accepting the thoughts. You're not saying, oh, no, this thought is coming up. How do I get it to stop? But it's more like, oh, well, uh, keep coming and like let's see what you do. And the more that you keep cultivating that accepting attitude, it doesn't bother you anymore. And to take it a little further, you start building thick skin. Because Harsh, I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of people seem so sensitive nowadays. And it's because it seems like everything gets under their skin and it just influences their thought patterns. So having that thick skin nowadays is so important because if you don't have it, you'll probably start becoming someone that you're not real quick. True. I think I think having thick skin is an asset in almost every situation. Like I can't think of a I can't think of a single situation where not having thin skin, uh, not having thick skin, would be good for you. Not not one situation I can think of. So it's always good to care less. Always. Yes, and especially in the world of public speaking, because a lot of people you'd be surprised they're successful in their professional lives. They're great family people. But right before they're about to get on stage, they're just saying, ah, dang, man, I just can't do it. And if you peel back as to why they say they can't do it, it always comes down to what will other people think of me, especially if I fail. And in Toastmasters, after a certain amount of time, you get to level up and become a Toastmasters mentor. And you just start to understand the psychology of different people. They're not afraid of failing. They're afraid of being judged for failing. So public speaking, if you could if you could keep exercising your thick skin, it's one of the most powerful tools to have, especially if you're also shy as well. Well, here's here's my tip for something like this, okay? You need to practice on people you are not going to meet again. 
because let's say you mess up in a situation let's let's say you're at a workplace okay and you do something very embarrassing what would happen is that you have to see all these people again and again and again and in that case you might legitimately be afraid of embarrassment but when you have when you are like say in a in a club or something and you're not going to see any of these people again let's say you're in a foreign country you can yeah. do whatever you want you, you, even if you really embarrass yourself who's going to know <laughs> you will true. literally not see anyone again have you ever tried something like that i have actually uh, have you read this book called the 4 hour work week i actually just bought it recently cuz i saw you make a tweet about that oh yes yeah. so it's a great book by tim, Par- by tim paris yeah tim timothy paris or something so i it's a very good book and it has a lot of these comfort challenges in them and a lot of them are very interesting they there's one where you have to make eye contact then there's one you have to get a girl's phone number so i, I did that one i did get a couple numbers and and when i read it this was 10 years ago so i was a teenager <laughs> so it was nice to be able to get phone numbers just by asking for them and um yeah i there, there was some one where you have to lie down on the footpath and i did that a couple of times because oh you did that yeah i did that i did that like thrice i did that once in a metro or or some i don't remember exactly because it's been 10 years so i did it once in an ice cream shop and once on the footpath where you have to just go and lie down on the it is not illegal there's there's no law against it so you can do it if you want the only only thing stopping you is your mind and i did that thrice because the first time i did it i was not very comfortable and i was i felt very judged so to get out of it i i did it again and then i did it again so yeah that that's what i did so i and, completely get what you're saying and what was the reaction when you do something like that like does the whole world stop everyone's watching you or do people just go about their days i mean how does it exactly work oh the whole world stops like people the stop and they're watching you and then you stand up and you walk away and everybody then starts to do their own thing <laughs> they forget about it in a minute <laughs> oh my god that's too funny man and afterwards i would recommend doing it you know like if, if someone's sick like, listening to this and get the book and do those comfort challenges because they really helped me in my life because when i started my businesses i was just able to sell very easily because i could like i would do i would reach out to people and ask them to buy that i would not have reached out to had i not had these experiences in my life i was not afraid of rejection because of this book interesting for our work week and there is different challenges that people should try out Yep, there's quite a few in them. I don't remember all of them because it's been a decade and that's a long time. But yeah, there's quite a few challenges in that book. A lot of that book is outdated now, but I remember these challenges were very helpful to me. They have been very helpful to me in my life. Has there harsh ever been a point in your life where you were shy or socially awkward? Oh man, when I was like 13 or 14. So when I was a kid, I was never shy. I I was always very social if I have taken that big five personality test and my extroversion comes out to be at 95 98% or something I'm extremely extroverted so I was never shy so to speak but there was a age where I thought no one was worth speaking to so I kept to myself simply because I felt that everybody else was a waste of time and but that was because I was in the wrong place the place I was at like say back in my school days people would talk about tv shows and actors and actresses and none of them ever meant any none of that ever appealed to me so i was sort of by myself because i thought everybody else was talking about things that i don't really care about so i would not say that i was shy i would say that i was alone because there was simply nothing no one better to talk to but when, once i got to college all of that changed Oh in terms of college uh you started to hang out with more people and you started and to socialize. We had like 50 people or 40 people I don't remember but co- my college had like thousands of people there so how is college like in India It, because I went to school in Bangladesh for a, s- a small period of my life when I was extremely young and then I moved into the US but I'm curious how is the college life in your area 
well I'll, i'll rephrase the word college so when i say college i mean 11th and 12th grade i don't mean uh, a a professional uh, a graduation degree because i don't have a graduation degree i i didn't i didn't go to formal um university so to, so to speak i didn't go to university where they give you a, i'm not a graduate um i'm a i'm a the i'm a chartered accountant i have a professional degree but uh, academically so to speak the last uh, graduation i had was my 12th grade so when i say college i mean 11th and 12th year it's pretty okay. mundane people are just having fun and studying on the side i didn't study much in 11th and 12th grade i, I just i just sort of winged it because in, in at that age i was more into getting fit and i had just started going to the gym in 11th and i was i was focused on that and i thought this is all nonsense and um i i, w- I was having fun in college I, i didn't actually study a lot got it and 11th and 12th grade for us in the west that's high school would you say it's similar similarities or no i mean it's hard to see because i haven't been in to a western world. high school so okay. I, i i wouldn't comment on that but from a regular school where you have to wear a uniform and everything to a college where you can wear whatever you want and have more fun there's a lot of leeway in what you can do uh, i did find it to be fun and as i said i was like focused on getting fit and you know i was having fun at that age got it what i've noticed with you harsh is you have a different types of education that you've done after you know i would say the formal education the 11th 12th where you know you're learning computer science you said earlier you read a lot of books so you seem sort of like a modern day autodidact how do you personally read do you read a certain do you speed read do you have a certain formula do you take notes uh, how do you consume content i think speed reading is bullshit because when you're speed reading you're not exactly registering information in your head i've tried it where i would read something very fast and nothing would stick like i would read a page and forget what was on that page so i read very slowly like i wouldn't say slow but i give a couple minutes per page at least and i don't take notes because that's that just takes too long to take notes i underline things that i like and that's it i just read it slowly i try to understand what's being said if i think a book is bad i just skip it so i here's here's one thing a lot of people do okay they if they pick up a book and the book sucks they will still read it just to complete it if i think a book sucks i'll just throw it away i'll pick a different book also oh, you don't finish it all the way through if you're not resonating with it yeah so the thing with a lot of books is that the author made it 300 pages because he had to make the book thick but that doesn't mean that there was 300 pages of actual text he had to communicate so sometimes the book will just keep saying the same shit over and over again and in different words and he isn't actually giving you so much information so if i find a book that can basically be summarized i have this app called ki book club key book club that i i would just read the summary and throw the book away i do that with like at least 30 to 40% of the books i pick up because a lot of books they, they were just written and the guy just wanted to make it thick so that people in a library or a bookstore might pick it up but as someone who's just trying to get more information i don't care if the book is thick or thin i care about what's what you're giving me what's the return on my time yep and i don't know about you but personally i've asked different people and i asked them when's the last time you read a book and for them that seemed as though it was a foreign question where <laughs> a lot of people haven't read a book in a decade and i'm not exaggerating when i say that and 10 years they haven't read a book just sat down and picked up something and went through it if someone is trying to cultivate this habit because for some people it's effortless where they could just pick up anything and read it and it's fun for them but for other people where it's it feels like work do you have any tips to start to ease yourself in and begin a reading journey because i do believe reading is individual journeys where 
two people haven't read the same exact things in their lives. And I think that's what makes it unique. Do you have a certain tip to getting started on your personal journey rather than just asking for recommendations and maybe not reading it? Yeah. So when you are starting out, say you don't have a reading habit, I would pick something light and I would pick fiction. I would not pick nonfiction because nonfiction sort of takes more effort to read. So I would pick like a thin fiction book like Animal Farm maybe or The Wolf of Wall Street. It's pretty thick, but it's a lot of fun to read it or Catch-22 or Harry Potter or something that's fun, like something you would look forward to reading. Are you getting me? After you go, after you get like fifty pages in, you want to want to read it. That instead of say being made to read it, and fiction is very good for that. It, if a good fiction book will make you want to read the whole story. And since you're the storytelling, I bet you know that the once you get done with one part of a story, the second part you are going to do it. You're not going to like leave it hanging. You want closure, so you're gonna complete that book. Yes, and that's the beauty of our storytelling, man. It's like once you get started, people are just hooked. It's due to the law of closure, where they want to close things. And that's why good storytelling is something that can be learned all around the world. And personally, I'm glad you brought up Harry Potter. That's one of the books I, I resonate with. I also recommend Dune if you're listening to this and you're thinking about starting your own reading journey. There's there's a beauty to reading harsh because it gives you more perspective. It allows mm-hmm. you to, if you are actually understanding what you're reading, instead of just trying to stack up books, if you're actually understanding what you're reading, if you're doing it correctly, it can not only make you more patient, it can actually improve your social skills. One of the subjects, harsh, that I think I've gotten so much more curious about ever since I entered the real world is history which may be surprising because when I go through history, I see that there's a lot of these individuals that had problems that I've had in my life as well. And when I see someone else having the same exact problem, I tend to personalize less in terms of life. And I I feel as though I have more variety and knowledge. Do you have a certain field like that, that's done wonders for you? That's other than uh, what you traditionally study, like business, math, that kind of stuff? I like autobiographies a lot because I've, I've found that most problems people have are very similar. So the things people worry about tend to be in a couple of categories. It's either health or it's finances or it's their dreams that they have a particular thing or they want some things in life and they don't have it yet. And it's usually or either this or the, a lack of social life where you feel lonely and alone. So I think these four are usually, which you could put, say, 80% of all problems into. And when you read an autobiography, what ends up happening is you you go through someone else's life and you pick up the lessons they have learned in their life and you apply it to your own. To give you an example, have you read Ben Franklin's autobiography? I have not. Is it good? It's very good. Okay. So uh, which, which autobiography have you read so that we can have like a better discussion? So I haven't read the autobiography of Leonardo da Vinci, but I'm reading his biography right now. So someone else wrote it, but it's extremely detailed where it has his past works, his life from the beginning to the end. Um, mm, autobiography I of a yogi. Okay, have you I read that? this? Okay, no, no, I have not. I'll, I'll talk about the Ben Franklin one. Okay, so the autobiography of Ben Franklin will teach you how your social skills can improve. And one of them, I'll just like, I, I, I'm just thinking off the top of my head is. Um, the guy in his book, he says that a lesson he learned in his life is that you don't have to tell people they're wrong, even if they're wrong. So you can just nod in agreement. And, you know, unless there's a reason to tell them they're wrong, you can just be like, okay, you're right. And that's something I, I, I was very bad at in my own life. I, if I thought someone was wrong, they would know. Like they would know that Harsh thinks this person is wrong. 
And I, I sort of learned that from Ben Franklin, and I, I'm now applying that in my own life. So if someone says some bullshit, I'll be like, okay, okay, okay. So unless I have a reason to correct them, I would not correct them. And that has helped me preserve a lot of relationships and, you know, keep friends that I have made instead of, say, and I've, I've avoided fights and arguments because of this. And it, it really helps. I think I think reading autobiographies is something everyone should do. Biographies and autobiographies. I would recommend this particular one. It's called Titan. And it's the life of John D. Rockefeller. And I would highly recommend everyone read it. John D. Get the Rockefeller. Audiobook. Yeah, the audiobook is very nice. Yeah, you but think... it's like Jeff- 35 hours. Sorry, he was How saying. many? It's 35 hours. Wow. Yeah, man. I mean, we're exposed to guys like Jeff Bezos, who's extremely massively wealthy in this world. And then there were individuals like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan. A lot of these mega billionaires a couple of hundred years back that I feel as though we could learn a lot from. Absolutely, man. The thing with, um, say, someone like Jeff Bezos is that there's not that much known about them because um, they're very private people and there's, there's just not enough information for you to learn from them, or at least from what I understand. But with someone like John D. Rockefeller, since he's dead, there's a lot of information available to biographers to tell you about their private lives. So that's something you can learn from the person's private life, how he handled things. But with someone who's alive, he isn't going to tell you incriminating stuff about himself, is he? Now, when you read uh, John D. Rockefeller's biography, you will find out how they would cheat other people by using railways as a way to get subsidies. Like what they would do is they would get the railways to subsidize their own goods while not giving subsidies to their competitors. And this way they would subsidize their own production. But this isn't the biography because John D. Rockefeller is now dead. So there's no point in keeping this a secret. This business is gone and the secret doesn't matter. But if Amazon is doing something like this, you just would not know because Jeff Bezos would not be dumb enough to tell you. So I think there's more to learn from dead people than alive people, simply because dead people have nothing to hide. They're already dead. Hmm, That's a unique insight. There's, there is a certain truth to that because why would, I feel like we'll learn more about Jeff Bezos a hundred years from now. Absolutely, man. Because once Jeff Bezos is dead, there's a lot of information people will say about him, like how he was, how he dealt with things that they will not say while he's still alive because there would be repercussions. Yeah, a lot of the people that are extremely successful, they seem so jolly, so happy-go-lucky. And I feel as though at times, how the hell did you rise up this high without you know, having, I wouldn't say a ruthlessness to you, but certain dark sides that people aren't aware about. It, guys like Warren Buffett too. Every now and then when I see him, I'm like this guy seems like someone's grandpa. He seems so jolly and nice. I wonder if there are certain things that we don't know yet that may have been helpful for him, but maybe we still got to keep finding out more about his personality traits, his social traits, his his movings in terms of how he carries himself. That's interesting. Yeah, we probably will after he's dead. Um, I don't think Warren Buffett is a very jolly person from me. I mean, it's that uh, if you're 95, do you really care about being jolly or not jolly? And I don't think, I don't think it matters to him. I've, I know about this uh, guy who works with him, uh, Charlie Munger, Charlie Muncher. Uh, I see you posting about him. Yeah, he has this book called Poor Charlie's Almanac. Which is worth reading, by the way. I strongly recommend that book. I have, I made a Twitter board out of it. I had my team say, take snippets from that book, and it's Adrid Charlie bot. So yeah, I, I would recommend reading that because Charlie Muncher did not hold back in that book. He, he he pulled quite a bit of punches. So I think Charlie Muncher is an example of someone who would share truths with you without having to die first. Are there certain individuals, Harsh, who's influenced your 
thinking a lot or do you try to just learn from different people well there have been a lot of influences in my life uh, i would not i could not pinpoint one particular person but a lot of different things have ha- i mean yeah, okay i'll put it like this i've read a lot of books i've read a lot of blogs and i have a ton of real world experience because i run two businesses right so i mean it's hard to sp- and it's hard to sp- hard to pinpoint or say this particular thing has had a lot of influence on me but it's all added up it, it's sort of like a cumulative journey the thing with learning is i don't know about the east as much in terms of the school models but you know in the west or better yet just school in general i feel like it's good to a certain degree but it doesn't teach you iterative learning where you're just constantly stacking up more experiences eliminating what doesn't work stacking up more experiences and eliminating what doesn't work i believe in the real world just getting that experience is so freaking key just like school you learn what works and implement it but a lot of parts of the real world you learn what doesn't work and you eliminate it and it's good to have a little bit of both or your the book smarts and street smarts that's just the whole process of learning nowadays you just got to let things stack up because most things in life it compounds not just money but skills and knowledge as well so it, it's just about sticking things through for the long term and just keep moving it forward in a direction are I there with you. yeah are I, there I certain agree. skills yeah are there oh, go ahead go ahead no no say say are there certain skills that you're just being patient on that you're working on because i'm sure when people think of life math money they thinking like oh well he's a great writer and i'm not sure if you told me this but i don't think you've ever been to like formal education for writing right you just kind of started learning through trial and error yeah and i i feel as though that's having too much formal education in certain fields of communication skills can hold you back because in order to thrive in twitter blogging you really just got to let your personality be shown and when you're focusing too much on the formal education part you're over here wor- worrying about your words too much your punctuation all that and you're putting the ideas on the back burner well it's Have you kind of like this like okay no, i'll put it like this when in theory there is no difference between practical life and theory but in practical life there is a difference between theory and practical life so what happens is when they teach you something in school you are taught certain things and then you have to give an exam of how much you retain that information but in real life you, you don't have data beforehand you need to collect data or rather you need to have conviction first and then test it so it, it's the opposite approach are you getting me so in school you would be taught the math and then you have to apply it in an exam in real life you need to have an opinion and then see if your opinion holds good or not uh, or you can you can arrive at an opinion by critical thinking or however but you need to form your opinion first and then apply it to the real world i, I think people who trade stocks get this more than anyone else where they have to first figure out what they think and then make a bet secondly i would say that too much formal education so unless you're like a doctor or something practice is superior to education because people who are teaching you in academics they themselves don't know that much about unless unless we're talking about a very technical thing like uh, medicine or designing computer chips i mean let's say if you are a lawyer you are better off practicing in real life than just reading more books about law because theory I mean it gives you some principles but no matter how much you read about swimming unless you get in the water you don't know how to swim right same with riding a bike for example exactly same with riding a bike and 
I'll, I'll give you a personal example since you mentioned writing. When I was in school, I would fail English all the time because my father was a farmer and we didn't have English education. So I'm the first person in my family to get a proper education, quote unquote. So no one in my family spoke English. So I learned English basically by going to school and talking to people there. But in all of the tests where they would ask you what a preposition is and what a noun is and what a subclause and mean clause is, I would fail those exams. And technically speaking, I should not be a writer. Like, I mean, if, if someone is failing his English exams, he shouldn't be a writer. But here I am. Yeah. Robert Kiyosaki, he's the guy who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that book is one of the top financial books of all time in terms of sales. And he keeps stating in that book, he's like, I'm not the best writer. I'm the best guy that could just get his ideas out there, which people can understand. And it's funny because you would think in a logical, like perfectly clean world, this guy probably has formal training, but he keeps stating, I have never been trained as a writer. I used to fail English class. I used to fail all that other stuff. You know, you just mentioned like preposition. I don't know what all that stuff is. I don't think people I, care I, that I much. I still don't know. I still don't know what a preposition <laughs> is. And I couldn't tell you what a noun is. Like if you ask me what's the definition of a noun, I don't know. I know how to speak. And if I know how to speak, I can just put that in words. And that's what my articles are. It's just me talking to you. It's just in text. And people like that because it's a new form of just thinking. I made a video regarding the autodidact mindset, and I was explaining how it's a little different than the mindset that thrives off of formal education. So if you picture like a cake, for example, in formal education, it's the theory that's the cake. I mean, for them, it's like, whoa, you know the theory. That's amazing. The second part of learning includes reasoning. How well are you able to reason? How well are you able to use logic? Well, in formal education, they measure your reasoning skills through the theory you learned, aka tests. That's exactly what tests are. Do you know the theory? Yes or no. And the icing on the cake for formal education is the actual practice, which is like, yeah, yeah, if you have experience, cool, but you don't need it. For the autodidact mindset, it's exactly opposite. It's experience that's the most important. And then you learn to reason among your different experiences. And the icing on the cake is the theory. It's like, whoa, there's theory for all my experiences. And now you have clean models. So all in all, it's just a different philosophy as a whole. Absolutely, man. I completely agree. You need you need both. But if you want theory first a bit of theory then you want to test it out you want to like practice it and then you want to go back to theory again you don't want to just keep bombarding yourself with theory 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 because it's just no use and a lot of people do that nowadays you know people people will do a graduation in some kind of mba or so, something okay they, they learn um uh, some kind of business degree and after they get done with their business degree they'll get another business degree i mean <laughs> what what are you doing man you could start a business start a business you learn more i guarantee it like you, any entrepreneurship degree is by definition bullshit because something like entrepreneurship cannot be taught you gotta learn it you gotta learn it by doing it yeah, you can learn it but you can't teach it I, I mean i could tell you some principles but i couldn't teach you how to do it you have to learn it yourself the thing with Toastmasters I love, which I hated at first, is they never necessarily just teach you public speaking. They'll give you a little bit of theory in the whole book, the curriculum, and then you're told to just give a speech. And I hated that before because I was like, but you're not teaching me? How am I supposed to learn? You learn by actually giving the speeches. And this <laughs> exactly. forces you to this forces you to overcome like extremely scary emotions. I don't know if you know this, Harsh, but public speaking is the number one fear on the planet. And it just marvels me because logically that doesn't make sense. 
you're only talking for 10 to 15 minutes. But when you're scared, it is what it is. So, yeah, I don't know how we got here, but I think it was basically connecting back with the whole concept of get a little theory to get started, start experiencing, and those theory will eventually start to take up life. Yep, that is true. Here's my problem with Toastmasters, and this is on, I've only been to Toastmasters a very a f- few times, not, not, not a lot, but they tend to be very superficial with the way they do things. So it's very, it's, your speech has to be empty. You can't have content in it. You have to like basically be very superficial. Are you getting me? I do think in certain cases, yes. Um, did you ever check out the te- the Pathways program or was this no. before Pathways started? This was a couple of years ago. I went a few times and I, I got like a ribbon I, <laughs> as a guest speaker. But uh, I, what I, this is my, my observation was that it, so the idea is they did focusing too much on presentation and avoiding that um and uh sound. Are you getting me? They, they count it. And my experience with real life is that that um and uh and you know those human sounds you make actually filler make words. you appear yeah. yeah filler words they make you appear more human and relatable so i think they they're focusing on perfection which is a bad idea because it makes you less human and less relatable you want to be connect you want to connect to people and to connect to people you have to be connectable and if you're too perfect too robotic you you're not that interesting have you seen Obama or someone speak? And even they use like, um, and a lot of filler words because you don't want to be too perfect because people can't relate to perfection. We're all humans. We have our faults. And I think this is, I think counting those filler words is inauthentic unless you, unless you're overdoing it, obviously, but some of it ha- is just, it's just natural. That's what I was going to say. If you're doing it a few times in the speech, I think you engage the pratfall effect, which states that humans like humans who act like humans, which is translation for flaws are all good. But when you're overdoing it a little too much, I do think that's a problem. Because when I was first entering the club for, this is a little embarrassing story, but for a two minute speech, I said, um, I think 30 times. And People were telling me afterwards, yo, Armani, man, you're over here saying um nonstop. And I kid you not, before that, I was completely unaware. I was like, wait, me? No, of course not. I didn't say that. But my club records the meetings, so or my past club did. And it just brought awareness to it. I do agree with you, though. I think just focusing on cleaning it up too much can be counterproductive. But I think... Uh, Get to a point where you're not saying it every other sentence like I used to, because that that could hurt your message. One thing with uh, one thing with just social media as a whole, harsh, is that when people start to get big, right, they start to act a little different. They start to act brand new, as we say in the West, and that basically means that they carry themselves like they're on a high horse. One thing that you keep doing, which I think is great, is you bring up other accounts. There's different accounts that you'll just give a shout out to that would be considered new or a smaller account. What keeps you grounded in that terms? Is it something deeper? Just talk to me about that. Well, it's sort of like when most people let's say they get big or they got a lot of attention, they don't simply change the presentation. They let the success kind of get into their heads. This Here's a problem with being successful. When you're successful, it tends to make you very overconfident and arrogant, and it makes you lethargic. Like it, You think that you, own, you, you now own the world, and... Uh, it makes you less cautious and it kind of makes you less aware of your own pitfalls. So these people are sort of like victims of their own success because 
once you do that you can't be more successful you you might be able to preserve the success you have but once you get to the point where you now you're an arrogant jerk because you're successful you've reached your limit you've peaked so i try to consciously avoid that i'm actually not an arrogant person in real life as well so i'm not arrogant on social media because I, i'm just not an arrogant person now i, I tend to sound arrogant to someone who's reading me for the first time because i like to have <laughs> my fun on social media calling people peasants and fags but <laughs> I, i'm not i'm not arrogant to be i mean it's refreshing to be to make fun of people sometimes but being arrogant is kind of dumb because you're only hurting yourself being arrogant while getting things done is a smart idea but if you if you're learning being arrogant while learning is a stupid idea yeah because it starts giving you that perception that you're the hub of all the right answers and it prevents you from supercharging your learning as well yeah i mean when you are arrogant while learning you think you already know everything so nothing can be taught to you you're like a pot that is already filled with water so it can't accept more water so you you don't want to be arrogant while learning but you do want to be arrogant while executing because otherwise you will have a lot of self doubt so you want to be like hey i'm the best at this while i'm doing it so that you don't you don't get that weird self doubt feeling that hey will i be able to do this or not interesting so you said you want to be humble in terms of learning and arrogant in terms of executing yes that's a great formula for being a winner <laughs> yep awesome well harsh i mean we can be talking for another couple of hours if need be and i do want to have you back on in this podcast in the near future this episode is a great start to helping other people know much more about you and you provided so much valuable tips insights and tricks unfiltered truths to help people level up and i appreciate you man always man i i love your content too by the way i i keep coming across it on twitter and I am I've been on your email list which is very nice I think I think more people should sign up to your email list it's underrated because I appreciate you you're the kind of person who who is real you know like you know you have all these people on social media who who say crazy shit like you need to make a million dollars in a year or you're a complete failure at life and you need to have 2000 girls and you need to be doing xyz unless you can deadlift 500 kg you're an idiot you're weak and you're not like that I mean Uh, even i'm not like that but i mean you you're like a reasonable real person so I, i i like your content i think i think if my audience is listening to this i think they should check your content out out as well i appreciate that man because in social media it's so easy to just put on this front and put on this oh, yeah you could do like this 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 10x things that doesn't necessarily provide value it gives you a little energy boost but after some time it's not applicable to the real world i believe that's one thing that your and my account has been able to do is to cut through the noise and speak with eternal lifelong principles yeah i mean speak something that's applicable to people you know i mean if if you tell someone that if they can't squat 250 kg that means they're a failure at life i mean you're not you're not helping anyone you're just making she's just being a cunt so, <laughs> <laughs> so there's no point and i think i think very few people are able to dial in that urge of being ridiculous and i think you're one of them i appreciate that man and that's why you and i get along so well it's funny because you and i we started our account one month away from each other and i still remember us speaking in the initial stages where i used to keep calling you like my daisy brother and <laughs> i think that's why we resonate we have um we have a lot of similarities in philosophies some parts are able to disagree without us getting disrespectful and all of that which is where to find nowadays absolutely man nowadays if you if if you vote for the wrong person you are now the enemy of our group so it's very divided yes and 
yeah, with that being said, I definitely want to have you back on again. We could carry on for a part two, but I can say that part one was a blast. Absolutely, man. I I will be back for part two. <laughs> for sure, bro. I thank you for joining the Armani Talks podcast. And harsh, my friend. I'll see you on the next episode. By the way, before we wrap up, where can other people find you? Just go to DuckDuckGo.com and type Life Math Money. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, and on LifeMathMoney.com. And if you go to newsletter.lifemathmoney.com, you'll find my newsletter sign-up link. I'm Life Math Money everywhere. Just easy to find. Awesome. And I'll drop the links in the description box right on below. If you follow me, I highly recommend you check out Life Math Money as well to learn more about the truths regarding life. Thank you, my friend, for joining today. And I will catch you on the next episode. Yep, yep. Thank you for having me here. By the way, don't forget to put your Bitcoin address in the description so people who think money is the root of all evil can send you your their money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to include that as well. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Take care, my friend.